we think, oh, that's Texas. We think that's Louisiana. We think that that's Mississippi. Because those are areas that have real high populations of black and brown folks. We are dealing with that within this community, within our state of Nebraska. All you need to do is look at our last legislative session that just ended, and you can see some of the bills that were being proposed that we may have been a proponent of, but a lot that we did oppose because those bills were built around bias, and they're built around inequity. And so this is an opportunity, this is uh, part of one of the sessions when we initially start working with an organization, taking that internal look. And as Maisha said, when we do that deep work looking at ourselves individually, we realize that our value set, our moral ways, the ways we have been socialized individually, that comes into play and it ends up spilling over into work a lot. So check your bias at the door before you work with you. Okay. And so let's have a conversation around this. All right. So as Karen said, we're here to look at bias and how it impacts our youth of color and their experience within the juvenile justice system. But before we can go ahead and talk about that, we have to make sure that we're all on the same page in regards to language and terminology. So I just want to talk a little bit more about what we mean when we say implicit bias. So for this workshop, this is where we're working from. Implicit bias is going to refer to the attitudes, the prejudices, and the judgments that we unconsciously hold for a group or person. Now, I said unconscious, so we are unaware of it, okay, until so something happens or we are trained to kind of look for it and acknowledge it. Now, I did see somewhere where they said that it is unaware and you often do not know where it stems from. I don't really believe the latter of that. I think if we can sit down and really look at it, then we'll be able to find where it stems from because that's how we're going to figure out how we can make sure that we educate ourselves so that we are thinking differently, right? So, we are all human beings, meaning you are taking in information daily. Your body is processing experiences, but not just your own experiences, other people's experiences. It's processing what you've heard and what you've learned and what your body is doing in regards to implicit bias. What it's doing, it's processing that information and then creating shortcuts to categories so that you know how to navigate or interact, right, with certain people. When you're in DEI work, I know a lot of you might hear implicit bias and you innately think, oh, negative. It's not always negative, right? Bias, implicit bias doesn't necessarily mean negative. It is your brain's way of helping you navigate However, your brain does not understand how to cut it off. It cannot di differentiate, tell the difference between an experience and an individual. I'll go ahead and give you an example, right? As I said, your body processes your experience and other people's experiences. Um, I'm a young woman. I'm in an area, we'll say 78th in that dorm. I'm walking down the streets a little bit late. I just went down the street to the Dollar Tree to grab some things. I'm on my way back home. Behind me, I hear a man say, hey, where are you going? Come here, come here. And he starts walking really, really fast towards me. I turn back around, and now I have to do something, right? Now, this person, me, in this scenario, I've never been in a situation, and I have a lot of people say this when we go through some DEI work and we're talking about some issues specifically pertaining to those identifying as women, um, that I haven't ever been in a situation where I felt um, threatened by a man in regards to um, sexually threatened by a man. However, I can tell you almost every woman has already processed and categorized a shortcut when they think they're about to be threatened, right? And you know why? Because we've heard the experiences of other women. When I was in college, I had to go to a seminar, right, that says this is how you keep yourself protected on campus. So I already have a bias of what I think a predator is, right? Um, I, male, it's home, 
the way he's walking towards me. And so my brain starts to process what do I do? We can say street smarts, what we do next as women. Uh, what do you do? What, you call somebody, you put them on speakerphone, right? Hey, I'm around the corner, you're around the corner too? We start doing things like that, right? Our bias, the shortcuts, it actually comes into play, right, to probably help. So in this scenario, I call somebody, I say, hey, you're around the corner, I'm gonna turn and walk around the corner, I'll see you there. The man hears, he turns, he walks away. That bias has actually protected me. Now you say, is it really bias? Yes, because if, if it was a woman walking behind me and said, hey, where are you going, come here, would I, would I have engaged? Probably, probably would turn around and go like, what? Because I'm not taught that women are predators, right? So I don't have that bias yet. I haven't created that category yet, right? But here's the other thing that happened to me. When I turned around to look, my brain started processing something else because this is my experience, my first experience in a situation like this. When I turned around, I noticed something about the man. I noticed that he aesthetically has the features that we attribute to a Hispanic man. I notice his accent. I notice where we are, on what side of town I'm at, right, I'm in. My brain starts to add to that shortcut and that category. I go home, I tell my friends about the situation, and a few of my friends say, really? Ooh, I had that same experience, same part of town, Hispanic man, accent. My brain starts to go ahead and process that. I turn on the TV, I see my policy makers trying to build a wall. Why? Because people who look like the man I just tried to escape, according to their rhetoric, are coming over here to do the thing that I just potentially escaped from to women. Your brain is processing it really, really fast and it's creating categories, right? It's creating shortcuts. So now the next time I'm out, I see a Hispanic man, all of a sudden I feel like I'm in danger. I feel like I'm gonna walk to the other side of the street, right? I feel threatened. I start to create a bias. I don't even know it. Again, your brain is processing this really, really fast. If you were to ask me outright, am I racist, right? Am I prejudiced? No, no, I'm not. But something happens when I see a Hispanic man. My body starts to internalize that it's dangerous. They're a criminal. What happens when I do not check that bias? What happens when I do not process that situation? And I get a job in the legal system, right? I become a probation officer. What happens when I become a police officer? and I interact with a Hispanic man, and he's trying to tell me what he did not do. In my mind, I automatically associate him with danger and being a criminal. And when we think about some of the characteristics of a criminal, they're liars, right? So I'm not gonna believe you. If I'm a judge, if I'm the person who makes decisions about your punishment, my implicit bias will sneak in, and I'm not just saying it, I'll tell you a lot of facts here in a minute. When it becomes un unchecked, it becomes harmful prejudices, harmful judgments, unconscious but harmful. And then we become a participant in a system that is oppressive and harmful to those we are trying to serve, even though our bias started out as something that was not malintent. My bias started when I was trying to get away from a certain dangerous situation. But because I did not process that situation, because it was fed into, my bias then became harmful, right? I hear a lot of stories like this when we're in DEI training. When we think about our bias, I'm gonna invite you here to think about something real quick. But when we think about our bias and people get up and they tell their stories, some of them do not always start out with, well, my granddad was racist. My dad was racist, this is what my dad told me. Some of these conversations start out with an experience that someone has had. And because they did not process it, they wind up creating bias 
right? And passing it on, okay? So this is what I'd like to invite you to do here at this moment. Think about a bias that you have. We all have them. We every, everyone has them. And I'll tell you about mine, or that I had to check. Think about your bias, and then think about where it stems from. I'm gonna invite you to think about the cycle of socialization, okay? The first layer of that cycle starts from home, when you were born. Blue means boy, pink means girl, you're already being socialized right away. And then I want you to think about the second tier of socialization, which are institutions, schools, churches, social organizations. Think about how that's played a role in your bias. Now I'll tell you about mine. Um, and it's just so interesting that we came um, from the speaker um, and she was talking about uh, kids not having problems. When I was younger in my household, that was also a thing. If you were a child, you don't have certain emotions because you're a kid. What do you got to worry about? Why are you upset? Why are you frustrated? Why are you mad? I didn't even have, to have the ability to have a nerve. I know when I got older and I got some nerves, whoop. Because I tell my parents, I heard them say, you get on my nerves. And I said, when I got irritated or frustrated, she getting on my nerves. You don't got no nerves? Oh. I, I wasn't born with those? Oh. I wasn't allowed to have nerves until I got out the house. But in my household, children were only allowed to have certain feelings or no feelings at all, right? And before we start to judge, my parents were in survival mode. So what they had to do compared, in their mind, compared to what I was feeling, there was no comparison. They had to make sure I survived, that I had, there was food that I could consume, and a place that I could live in. So when I came to them about something that happened in school, right, or some type of complex emotion that I had to them, it did not compare, right? When I got older, I took on those feelings when I started to work at a middle school. And I could not understand why all these kids had all these feelings. Because I'm like, hey, just go back to class. What are you doing? What's going on? I took that on about youth. I had a bias towards youth and what they can feel. And then what I started doing at a point was I invalidated their feelings. As we shared upstairs, they're going through a lot of things that I never went through. But how powerful your parents are and the cycle of socialization, even though I was young and I was having these feelings, my parents still outweighed what I was feeling because then I took it on as my bias. Think about how that plays into policy. Because I feel that youth are not able to have certain feelings. I start to create policies like zero tolerance, right? We have zero tolerance for this. Just, just go to class, do what you're told. I start to create harmful policies. And then I become a part of a system that is harmful and oppressive and not inclusive. And this is the importance of checking your bias. So I'll give you like one minute or two to just think about something that you were taught, right? And if it turned into a bias, right? And how it's affected you and your job and the way you connect with your clients. By the way, I did check my bias, my bias. It was all good before I got out of that middle school. I was able <laughs> to check. Of course, kids have all types of emotions that are validated, that are real, that are important, and they matter. But it took me a minute to be able to do the work because I was taught that that was not the case. All right, do we have anybody that want to share? Yes. So, um, a bias that I had just having one of my clients, he's a youth Hispanic boy, and he's not doing so good in school. So, a bias that I automatically had because I'm Hispanic and I'm like, he's lazy. Um, but come to know that he has an IEP and you know, we're trying to work on things and he just doesn't understand. But that may be the case but still his actions show something else. So 
So it's like one of those things where it can be one or the other or both. And so that's a bias that I just recently had. But I have to remember it in my life that I'm here for him and I need to help him with the resources. And the, that goes the same way with the mom as well. Anybody else? Oh, we do, everybody. <laughs> while Maisha's passing, the mind, it reminds me of Dr. Michelle yesterday when he shared in the workshop right after the opening uh, speech about uh, the group, his colleague being so reluctant to share the results of the implicit bias test. Quickly, I want a show of hands. Have you ever taken the implicit bias test? Yes. Were you ready to share your results after that test? <laughs> no. Yes. no. Okay. Yes. So. Yeah, I know for me, um, just with the position that my family is, like with ICE agents and stuff like that, even with the police department. I know I was taught that, you know, don't seek for help from the police. Just because we've had also situations in my family where my mom is Hispanic. Um, they were in a car. She picked up my brother from Boy Scouts. They got pulled over. And my brother has these, uh, what are they called, miskits? Um, they're like these little pots and pans. And uh, the police officer asked my brother uh, if my mom was doing drugs on that. Just because she's Hispanic. Uh, my brother said, no, I'm a Boy Scout. These are cooking pots and pans. And also not too long ago, uh, my brother was in a car sleeping um, and a police officer knocked on the window. And the question that he asked him was, he had his construction clothes. And um, the police officer asked him, uh, you were probably on cocaine or you were probably smoking weed. And so just putting that connotation of drugs uh, with the Hispanic community and my family is very damaging. Um, and I work for a youth program, a Latino youth program. And so a lot of the times too, when we work with kids, it's like that fear of officers or kids getting in trouble all the time. Um, and for me too, like one thing that I've made a goal during my work is that I have a youth soccer program and we partnered up with LPD. But even that was challenging because it's like, how do I know that you're here to support me? How do I know that you're here for the good thing? Like you're actually coming to uh, interact and spend time with people or my kids because they're my kids, and so it's like, ah, oh, I don't like the police. Mm -hmm. But just being able to share that time and that um, part of being educated, you know, like, hey, you know, they're not always bad people. Um, they can help you for good things, but at the same time, it's that fear in my community that happens too with the police department. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. I grew up in a home where the only emotion that it was really safe to express was happiness. You couldn't be sad. Um, I mean, maybe if somebody died, you could be sad for about that long. You get a hug, dry those tears, it's over, suck it up, celebrate. Um, and you certainly couldn't be angry because that was a sign of weakness. You never let anybody know that they got to you, that they had that much control or power over your life. And subsequently, I never learned to process those emotions in a healthy way. I didn't know how to appropriately ex express anger. And when I felt sadness, um, I thought I had to hide that. I could never let anybody see that. Um, and, and develop you know, internal coping mechanisms that weren't always you know, they, they weren't always the best. They just weren't, I mean, I just kind of had to do what I had to do to, to hide that and protect myself. So it, it challenged me interacting with other people as I got older and my expectations of other people and how they express their emotions. And still I find myself sometimes judging people who 
they express their anger overtly, and I'm like, oh man, you're really out of control with yourself. Even if they're not being inappropriate, it just that sign of them it be knowing that someone's angry is like, oh, they need to get a handle on it. So. These are, well, that's because it's my point. I'll read it just one slide. Um, these are all great examples. Thank you all for sharing with the group. Um, and I thank the group for you know being able to, uh, again, sit here through this and provide a space where people feel comfortable to share. So thank you. Uh, but how does this translate, again, into us working with juvenile and the juvenile justice system? We know that students of color and um, white youth, sorry, youth of color and white youth, they um, engage in illegal acts or crimes at the same rate. However, uh, youth of color are over-policed and overrepresented in our juvenile justice system. Now, this notion that our youth of color somehow deserve harsher punishment, punishment was really amplified during the 1980s with that whole super predator myth, right? Right? That there is a new special breed of youth that's coming to destroy the country with an emphasis on youth of color. And so I talked about some factors that go into creating bias, right? For my story, it was the ethnicity, right? For my personal story, my made up story was ethnicity, my personal story was age. What are some other factors that contribute to bias? Ethnicity, age. Profession. Profession, yep. Gender. Yes. Gender. Yes. Gender. Yes. 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 Environment. Yes. Environment. Yes. I thought you were saying, I'm sorry. Yes. I said environment. Environment. Yes. These are really, really good factors that play into us creating bias. So in regards to um, youth of color, here's some facts that we have. Black youth with no prior admissions to state facilities were nine times as likely to be committed to the state facilities as white youth with no prior admissions. This is all based on some of the bias that our stakeholders have in regards to youth of color. When we talk about age, Police officers and the public always, always overestimate the age of black and brown youth. Tell me, what is the difference when you interact with a 12-year-old versus a 17-year-old? Anybody can tell me? Sorry? 12 year old you think of as a kid. 12 year old you think of as a kid, right? Yeah. Right? Maybe more leniency. Yes. Um, more support. More support, yep. There's less expected of a 12 year old versus a 17 year old. Right. Right. So when police officers and the general public come into contact with a 12 year old black boy, they don't afford them all the things you just said because to them they're 17 years old and they deserve less protection and they're dangerous, okay? All right, so in regards to some of the other distorted perceptions of youth of color, um, with girls of color, this one really got me. Um, participants also viewed um, girls as behaving and seeming older than they actually were and therefore, they are more knowledgeable about adult topics, including sex. These are girls of color. Black girls, as more, they viewed black girls as more adult than white girls and as needing less protection, protection and nurturing than white girls. These are our young girls going into the system, and they need less nurturing and protection. Okay, so that means less resources are afforded to them. Because into the, in the eyes of people making the decisions, they need less protection and nurture. Yes, I saw you back here with Steve. Yes. All right. So I just, um, I have a story that's related. Yeah. Just serving juvenile services. 
Yeah. Uh, but last year when Creighton women's basketball won the Big East tournament, mm -hmm. there were two young ladies that received accolades because mm -hmm. of a accomplishment, a milestone. Um, Jayla Zimmerman had been injured, but then she reached a milestone in the program. And so did Keely Davis, a young African-American lady. They're both seniors. Yeah. The coach gave Zimmerman all kinds of accolades. And when Keely Davis said, if you didn't acknowledge me, she said, oh, you don't need to know. You know you've done a great job. Yeah. You know, it's, it's this yeah. idea that she did not need the same type of accolade or acknowledgement as the white player. And it was, it was so blatant. But the more I learned about adultification, the more apparent that became to me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we can take that logic and even take it into the medical field when it comes to black women, yeah. right? The bias that we, our threshold for pain is way higher. So we don't get certain medications prescribed to us when we should. They're not listening to us when we tell them that something's wrong. That could be one thing, parents, media, you're talking about when you were a child. So what's being fed into them, it, it comes from that. And when we talk about bias and how to address bias, that's one of the things, education. A lot of times, if you go out and you look for it, there is so much data to prove that bias wrong, right? And so um, I, I agree with what was just said here. It could be parents, um, it could just be the adults in, in, in their community um, that is passing down. Again, when yours is not checked, you teach your kids. Well, and some of that historical, you know, what happened to slave women, that's carried on, you know, all of those things that are carried on through, through history. But mm -hmm. as a child, you don't understand, if you don't know that history, you don't know where those beliefs, where those ideas came from. Exactly. Yeah. Well, you don't even know the question. Yeah, yeah. you don't. So, yeah. 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 Because you're moving towards acceptance. Mm -hmm. and this is the behavior that is being accepted, sometimes being praised and celebrated. Yeah. The last thing I'll talk about here with implicit bias, and then I'll go ahead and turn it over to Karen, and she can talk about how it sometimes shows up, like in microaggressions, with microaggressions. But in regards to the juvenile justice system, um, studies were done that concluded that stakeholders, and when they mean stakeholders, that are probation officers, police officers, and judges, 
when they explicit, explicitly knew the race of the youth um, that offended, the bias in perceptions of culpability was harsher or negative. The risk of reoffending was higher. And the notion that they deserved punishment and a harsher punishment was there when they specifically, explicitly knew the race of the offended, uh, the one who offended, sorry. In regards to probation officers, when they wrote up, um, and I'll, later I'll do an actual uh, excerpt from one of the probation officers' um, kind of narrative of, of two clients who committed the same crime, one black, one white, and what and what they uh, what what they wrote. But in regards to probation officers, when um, they have a client that's a client of color, and they have offended, they attribute that to something being innately wrong with them, right? It's an individual failing. So the state has to step in to fix it. When it is a white client, it's external. They just don't have the right mentor. Their home life is just, it's not right. So who steps in when it's external? If the state is stepping in when it's internal, who's stepping in when it's external? They don't have a mentor. How many, come on, think about it. Community steps in when it's external. They don't have a mentor. Teammates step in, right? The environment of their home, COC step in. They can stay with us for you know a few extra hours. We'll feed them. Community can come and surround the external factors, but for the internal factors, the state and the court has to get involved with that. Okay. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over as you think about that to Karen. Right. Thanks, Naisha. So when we are working with DEI, and if you've been through any DEI training, you've learned about all these different types of biases, right? Well, for the purpose of this conversation, we just want to center on a few of those biases. Um, first, we have affinity bias. And affinity is just that. You look for folks that think similar to you. And typically, when we think about like a, a correctional center, rehabilitation center, or something like that, the folks that are on the front line working with the client usually have someone in a affinity. If they're going into a room to get someone because they need to de-escalate them, they're all going to kind of move from the same viewpoint. And as Maisha mentioned about different write-ups, um, what they would take away from that and how they move through that process of working with that client is an affinity of purpose and an affinity of action. We know, based on the data, that there are significant differences of how those clients are being treated, and a lot of that is due to race. Uh, confirmation bias, I'm going to go quickly through these. Confirmation bias, think about a self-fulfilling prophecy. I'm going to look for those factors those demographics, all of those other categories that confirm what I already believe, what I already believe by this set of folks, what I already believe about an individual that looks like this, that come from a single parent household, that probably didn't have a father present in the home. All those kinds of things confirm why I believe this individual is now in this situation and therefore I treat them thusly or according to my confirmation and my set of beliefs. The halo effect, and we heard a little bit about this in um, a previous session on restorative justice, and they were talking about a young lady that came into the lighthouse, and she, they said she was a cheerleader, and she was bubbly, she was sweet, she was making brownies for everybody, she walked in the first day, hello, and they're like, why is she here? Well, come to find out, she was an individual that had committed a real severe assault on someone. But that halo effect was that she doesn't look like the average offender. What she could have done, somebody had to perpetuate that crime. They had to lead her into that. Maybe she was just an accessory to this crime. And when I thought about halo, it reminded me of, of a few years back 
the young man that was being released from incarceration that was such a good looking guy, you know, with the blue eyes. I think he was a mixed race individual. And all the women were writing, oh my God, he is so good looking. Maybe now I need to date somebody that's incarcerated. And he came out and he got a wife that was worth millions of dollars. That halo effect is that I'm going to treat you differently because you look a certain way. You don't look like that typical criminal. You don't look like that Hispanic guy, as we heard over here earlier, that that's what we think a criminal or a felon looks like. So, go ahead. The halo effect is really, I see one positive thing about you, and then I assume everything um, that has to do with that is positive. Think about education. Uh, you go to Harvard, so I assume a lot about that. I mean, you are a great leader. Mm -hmm. happens. Harvard graduates, right? We just assume everything great about this one person because of one aspect of, of their life. Or we assume that that one aspect, just again, Harvard, anybody that goes to Harvard, they're great, mm -hmm. right? So, yeah. So it's real interesting when we hear white collar criminals. Think about that. I see some head shaking. Yes. So the opposite of that is the horns effect. Oh my God, look at this individual. Has no right to be out here among the general public. I turn around and I look at that person and I think, oh my God, they can really do harm to me. We look at one characteristic of this individual and then we decide criminal, hard criminal, hard time. Give them the harsher punishment. It's been noted uh, in the data that jury form these kinds of decisions sometimes, harsher sentences, and the punishment of guilty because of looking at perhaps one characteristic of an individual, and then one strong voice in that jury room that has these kind of beliefs, and now the rest of the group is swayed, and this is how they will vote. And we know that that falls a lot along gender lines and more Importantly, it falls along racial lines, how that happens. I would say an example of this is um, Trayvon Martin. Uh, I know some of us were in a uh, session yesterday and um, when they were looking at the headlines uh, when Trayvon Martin was shot, they put in there one of the headlines, uh, Trayvon Martin was suspended three times from school. I know you're like, well, what am I gonna do with it? Yeah, but that's the horns effect. One thing, negative thing, and then now we can say he's a bad person. Mm -hmm. That's what that is. Zip code for what size county it was on. Yep. Omaha. Omaha. Okay. Omaha. Yeah. Oh, he's from Omaha. Yeah. He's yeah. from South Omaha. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very much. Yeah. 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 Okay. So let's talk about microaggression just a little bit more. Micro and really. Microaggressions in action of those that are in the personnel or the authority role sometimes is even more dangerous as the individual that we're saying committed an act of violence or some type of criminal act. And so I will move quickly with these because I realize our time has moved so, so uh, quickly. But what do you think micro assault is? Anyone has an idea? Micro assault or micro? Exactly. And isn't it interesting that the word micro, that part of the word micro comes first? Is it, is it micro to the receiver? Typically not. Okay, very good. Uh, micro insult. What do you think that would be? What is a micro insult? If it's an insult? A, I'm sorry? A distasteful joke. Distasteful joke? Like a backhanded compliment. Backhanded compliment. Good one, Courtney. Okay. Uh, quickly, micro invalidation. And think about some of the conversation we've had before. 
So looking at that part of the word, if we break it up, take that micro out of there, what is invalidation? Oh, okay. <laughs> oh well, uh, we'll get you next. <laughs> oh, God. oh gosh. Oh gosh. I mean, I, all these words extend it, right? Yes. Think about That's what I want you to do. If you're ever in the training and so we talk about why we should change certain rules. Yes. And somebody comes back and says, you're just being sensitive, right? You're just being sensitive. Why, why, why do we have to change that? Why can't we call you that? So when it was terrible to call me that in the first place, mm -hmm. and when it began, I was invalidated then. Mm -hmm. And then we get to a place where we can speak up and talk about it, and then you invalidate me again by telling me I'm being sensitive. Mm -hmm. You're robbing me of my dignity and my self-respect, but it's my role. Invalidation. Yes. Okay. So, in, in addressing microaggressions, we have a short video that we want to show with you. It's just a real short clip. You have. A
That's what we're talking about. Those are those little irritating, buzzy mosquitoes that find a way to come out summer, winter, spring, fall to irritate you. <laughs> and a lot of times, the person that's saying it, it's not, they don't think they're being rude or mean, right? The incident that she was talking about, actually, she was trying to compliment myself, Karen, and our third facilitator on the good job that she thought we was doing with this training. And she said, oh my goodness, isn't it great for them to see three black women, you're educated and you're not coming at us like, yo, yo, yo. Wow. Wow. Like, yo, what? <laughs> <laughs> you see this face? I said, I said, excuse me? Yeah. You know, and we had to have a conversation even after the training. We have been like a four hour training, you're, you're drained. But still had to have that conversation because unless you all sat around and had that conversation, that didn't come from them. That came from you. Right? Yes. Bias. She had a bias, didn't even realize it. She had a bias about black women and their education. And thinking it was a compliment. But she really thought she was giving it as it was a compliment. Yes. All right, as we got a couple of more minutes left, yes. sorry. Um, recognizing the impact of ethnic and racial disparities. Remember I told you I was gonna come back to this study here. We do have the handout, so if you, we left it here on the table if you would like to take it so that you can have it. Um, you can use it for like if you do staff trainings or anything to have some numbers and some data behind why it is important that we talk about bias, especially within this system. Um, so there was a study uh, where 233 narrative reports written by probation officers um, were looked over. Um, and there was a prediction that was made um, that a relationship between the youth's race and population um, officer's perception of the causes, oh, sorry, race and probation's officer perception of the causes of crime, um, likelihood of recidivism, and sentence of youth would receive. They found that black youth were judged at a higher risk of reoffending than white youth. Um, this is an example, two 17-year-old boys saying probation officer. Both had no prior criminal history. Um, both charged with first degree robbery with a firearm, no injuries in either incident, one case robbed a gas station, um, the other case robbery of two motels. One boy was black, the other was white. Um, we're going to say the first uh, boy was Ed. Um, this was written about Ed. This robbery was very dangerous as Ed confronted the victim with a loaded shotgun. He pointed it at the victim and demanded that he place the money in a paper bag. This appears to be a premeditated and willful act by Ed. There is an adult quality to this referral. In talking with Ed, what was evident was the relaxed and open way he discussed his lifestyle. There didn't seem to be any desire to change. There was no expression of remorse from the young man. There was no moral content to his comment. Now Lou, right? This is for Lou, the next person. Um, again, same crime. Lou is a victim of a broken home. He is trying to be his own man, but is seemingly easily misled and follows other delinquents against their better judgment. Lou is a tall, <laughs> sorry, little boy who is terrified by his present predicament. It appears that he is indeed in need of drug and alcohol evaluation and treatment. Guess who was Ed and guess who was Lou? Mm -hmm. um, where, you know, an adult cop 
Bach is looking at me and I'm seeing his son. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that's right. 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 You can't see you can't see your mother, you can't yep. see your father, you can't see your grandparents. Mm -hmm. um, that's dangerous. It's extremely dangerous. But it's it's a, your part five. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What you're what you're describing. Yep. And also can I have one more Think about, was it just a year ago, or maybe a little longer than a year ago, a young man down in Florida was drinking with all the friends at the house, and they jumped in the truck to go buy more beer. They were having a party. Now, I think the kid was about eight, uh, 15 at the time, and eight of them crowd into this pickup to go to the liquor store to go steal more beer. I think they ended up going to Walmart and stole some beer. And they charged that kid with what? After that kid killed four people and now that kid has been paroled. I think now his mother is actually in prison because the mother helped him to escape the country. The system is so imbalanced and I don't like saying the system is broken, but it's broken. It's broken and it's so imbalanced and it's so blatant at this time now. And that's why I'm going to urge you, well, I know we only have a few minutes left and I'll turn it back over to Myesha. We have to really use our voice and policy. We know the young folks that we work with and we know all of the inequities and the disparities and we see it. It's written in the books and just because it's written in the books does not mean it's right. And we know what's happening. So we have to keep getting out there. I receive sometimes a lot of pushback about why do I advocate so much? Well, we won't have a future if we don't advocate and we don't get reform around a lot of these things. And to me, it's even more harmful and more hurtful that these things are happening against young folks whose brains have not even finished developing yet. Just because I have this melanin in my skin tone means that I need to be treated differently. It's time we change that whole narrative. All right. Well, maybe that's it. She said it. Because um, <laughs> we have we have come to time, and I don't want to I don't want to take you out <laughs> from the rest. But what we could yeah we're doing some time. Uh, but I just want to thank you. We did have this uploaded. One thing that you can do to check your bias, of course, of course, is to educate yourself. Um, as individuals in this room, I know you. A lot of you picked up. Uh, raise your hand when you say you took the implicit bias test. What you can do um, to help educate yourself is when those thoughts come up, say, ooh, ooh, ooh. Why did you say that? Ooh, that was a slow driver who was making me upset. I rolled around and I saw the ethnicity of the driver. And the ethnicity of driving was Asian. I was like, oh, no way. Ooh. 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 Ooh, why did I say that, right? Um, a, a video that we show, Verna Meyer's amazing. Um, and she talks about, and it's simple, educate yourself. Um, how to overcome bias, run towards it and educate yourself. I love her example when she found out she had bias against women. She's on a plane. She see a woman pilot, a woman pilot, and she's like, oh, girl, yeah. They get up there, turbulence happens. She said, ooh, I hope she passed the test. <laughs> <laughs> this is when she was looking for a male pilot. Ah, she said she didn't know that. She didn't, she didn't know uh, flying male. That's what I need, flying male, OK? Same video. She talks about the example of a co-facilitator of DEI work. They're in New York, they're lost. They see a black man. Verna said, I know black men, I love them, right? She wants to walk towards him. Her co um, facilitator wants to walk away. Ooh. And she's a facilitator of the DI work. And she had to, what just happened? So when it comes up, <coughs> we have to take those moments and, ooh, why did I say that? What just happened? Okay? Check your bias. Thank you all. Thank you.